Let's stand and start with this song. Joy to the world.
Praise the Lord. Come on, praise his holy name. Lord, you're worthy of our praise. What you've done for me, you are faithful. You never failed me yet, never failed me yet. You've been good to me, and I'm grateful, grateful. How can I forget? How can I forget? 
forget how can i forget what you've done for me you are faithful you never fail me yet never fail me yet you're so good to me come on declare that today if that's you come on how can i forget how can i forget what you've done for me he's so faithful never fail me yet never fail me yet you are good to me and i'm grateful let's take it up here we go You've done for me, you are faithful. Never fail me yet, never fail me yet. You are good to me. What time you have done, how can I forget? How can I forget? What you've done for me, you are faithful. Never fail me yet, never fail me yet. You're so good to me. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise the Lord. Living here has caused me pain. Things I just don't understand. I must recount your faithfulness and the mercy of your hand. When everything is said and done and there's nothing left to say, the cross of Christ is proof enough you are good you are good you are good your mercy lord your mercy lord has pierced my heart Brings me to my knees. In reverent fear, in reverent fear, I'll trust your ways and worship at your feet. 
everything is said and done. Come on. Everything is said and done. And there's done. nothing left to say. There's nothing left to say. The cross of Christ is proof enough. You are good. You are Sing it again. Your mercy, Lord. Help us sing. Your mercy, Lord, has pierced my heart. It brings me to my knees. In reverent fear, I'll trust your ways and worship at your feet. When everything is said and done. When everything is said and done. There's nothing left to to say. The cross of Christ. The cross of Christ is proof enough. You are good. You are good. You are good. Yes, sir. with us when everything is said and done. Lord, you are. 
are good. You are good. Father, we thank you and we praise you for your goodness, your grace, your mercy, your spirit. We worship you. We aggrandize you. We lift you up. We exalt you in this place. Jesus, you said if you would be lifted up, you would draw all men unto you. We lift you up this, this day, and we pray that those that you would choose, that you would draw them to you. Jesus. Men and women, boys and girls, all have come into this building, and every one of them in a different place in life, facing things, going through things, living there are those who are unsaved. There are those who have put faith in Christ. There are, there are those that have need. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that by your spirit, you would irrigate down these aisles and in and out of these seats. And would you touch every person? May each and every one of us, when we leave this place in a little while, be able to say we have been in his manifested presence. And our lives are forever changed because of it. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Let God's people say amen. amen. Give somebody a hug next to you. Look them in the eye and say, I love you more than you love me. It's true. I love you more than you love me. It's true. You may be seated. Praise God. All right, you can stop loving on each other now. <laughs> I like that. You have to make them stop loving on each other. I want to have the ushers come in just a moment. In just a moment. Before we do that, uh, first of all, I want to welcome everyone here this morning on this beautiful December morning. Are you ready for Christmas? Yeah. Yeah. Obviously, you haven't got my list yet. But uh, we're so thankful for each of you that are here. Of course, our online congregation. Will you please take a moment and welcome our online congregation as well and thank them for being with us. God bless you. Wherever you are, we're thankful for each of you that are in the building, each of you that are online. I want to encourage you to continue to, to dive right in, be a part of our church. God is doing great things. Uh, a couple of things real quick. We have Wednesday night service at 7 o'clock. We've been having tremendous Wednesday evening services, then I, I want you to invite people. Invite people to come with you. Invite people online. They can come to church wherever they are. Online, go to Facebook. Uh, we're on Facebook, Life Change Church. And consequently, go to Life Change Church and like it. Why? Because you like Life Change Church. So go to Life Change Church Facebook and hit like. And listen, that was weak, but when I get to this one, it's, it's got to be better. Go to Pastor Troy Irvin Facebook page and like it. Why? Yeah, that wasn't much. Because you like him. At least I hope. I like you. Great things are happening at Life Change Church. God is moving in incredible ways. What we've seen the last few months, uh, words can't describe. And God is always moving. You know, one of the things that's recently taken place is our youth pastor, J.J., and his wife, I felt God call them to, uh, uh, to be a pastor. They haven't got an open door yet. They just felt like it was time for them to step in faith. And they resigned as the youth pastor. And they'll be closing out at the end of the year here. And we're excited for them in this new venture where God is taking them. We're praying that God will open the right door at the right time at the right place for the right reason. And God's going to use them greatly wherever he ends up planting them. Always remember something, church. The strength of the, uh, the strength of the church, let me say this, the strength of a church is not how many are coming, but how many are being sent. Listen. We live in a day where a lot of people put a big focus on how many people are coming. How, how big can we build our church? How many people we get coming? Jesus never looked at how many people he could get to come. He said, how many do I have to send out for the work of the gospel? He sent out the 70. He sent out the 12. He would tell them, go ye therefore. 
It is our responsibility to raise people up, foster them in their calling, whatever it may be. And some may stay here forever and others may go to the far ends of the earth. But wouldn't it be something if God raised up preachers and missionaries and teachers and so on and so forth that sent them out from this salt shaker? Salt does no good in the shaker. Sprinkle it, baby. It'll make everything taste better. So we want to we want to send people out and how exciting it is you know jj was called to preach in this church and now he's being sent out and god's doing great things it left a vacancy of course for the youth pastor and we as elders have met and prayed and met and prayed and really felt the direction of the holy spirit there's a young man that i've known since he was just a child and he has been greatly influenced by god and called by god to preach he graduated from the same college that I graduated from. That can't be all bad. But, you know, he's been a part of our church off and on for, for many, many years. And we love he and his wife and family so very much. We believe God uh, has chosen him to take the spot of the youth, youth pastor. And I want Justin Critzweiser to come, please, and stand before this congregation. And I want you to welcome him and his wife. Come on. Will you please give them a real welcome? A life change church welcome to the youth pastor job. We're thankful for them and uh, excited. For what God is going to do in and through them. Will you come down guys? You know, I, like I said, I've known I've known Justin since he was four years old. I preached revivals in the church that he attended with his mother. Years ago, when I was, I was 19, I think, the first time I ever preached, he was probably, what, four or five years old, just a child. His grandpa on his mother's side, wonderful man, wonderful Christian man. He and his family loved God. They always liked to hear me preach, so they got to be okay. But uh, he's a great, great man. I hope he sees this. I've always loved him so dearly. But God has had his hand on this, this young man, and we're going to see great things happen through him. I want the elders to come and uh, some, some men to gather around and ordain ministers and different ones to come. And I know you just sat down, most of you, but I'm going to have the congregation stand. We're going to pray and anoint Justin and his wife for the task that we believe the Holy Spirit has earmarked them for. So, yes, will you bring the oil? Thank you, sir. And the congregation, will you lift your hands toward this couple? And let's pray. I want you to pray in concert with me. Let's pray together and believe God to start this off on the right foot. Father, I thank you and I praise you for Justin. And we anoint him with the oil, he and his wife, that represents the Holy Ghost. And I pray, God, that as you have chosen him and ordained him, really from the foundations of the earth, your anointing is upon him. I pray, God, that you'll strengthen that anointing that you'll use him to preach the gospel, that you'll use him to teach the word, that you'll use him to lead these young people and all people to Jesus Christ, that God, you'll set him aside for your glory and for your use at this time, for such a time as this, you have brought him to the kingdom. It is no accident that he is here, but he is here on purpose, sovereignly selected for this time, for this reason, for this task. And we pray that the anointing would increase upon his life and that you'll use him greatly in this ministry to preach the gospel. In Jesus' name we pray, may it be so. In Jesus' name, let God's people say praise the Lord. Let's thank God one more time for what he's doing here at Life Change Church. Praise God. Praise God. Ushers, will you please take your place? We're going to receive the morning tithe and offering. We're thankful for you that are faithfully each and every week uh, tithing and giving and minding God and worshiping God in, in the obedience of our giving. And we appreciate it so very much. And uh, I, I, I just know that God's going to continue to bless you and multiply it over and over, 30, 60, even 100 fold in your life. Father, I pray that your blessing would be upon this offering. Would you multiply it, not only in the working of this church, 
but in the blessing of the lives of those people that give. Bless every gift, every giver. Those who long to give and don't have it, would you bless them so that they may, in Jesus' name, amen. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and he shall reign over I want you to turn with me in your Bible to Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 and 7. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 and 7, as we continue our sermon series this morning, Who is Jesus? I'm going to have you stand. Please let us reverence the Word of God as it is read. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, 
Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice. From henceforth even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Preaching this morning, who is Jesus, let us pray. Father, what a joy it is to be here in your presence. We thank you that you are here with us in person and presence of the Holy Spirit. We pray that you would continue with your presence. And would you touch and anoint each and every one of us. Anoint our mind, our heart, that we will understand and receive your truth and as the anointing pierces our soul to bring the truth of your word to the depths of who we are may it perform every bit of the task that you've sent it forth to do i thank you for what you're going to do in this place and i ask god that your word that your word would be embedded deep within us today and may it spring to everlasting life in jesus name Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Who is Jesus? It is the question of the ages. Looming in the mind and heart of men and women, perhaps even pestering the soul of humanity. Who is Jesus? The greatest minds of human history have contemplated dissected this simple yet complex question. Who is Jesus? It is a question that even he himself would look at the disciples and say, whom do men say that I am? And They would say, some say that you're one of the prophets. Some say that you're John the Baptist, Jeremiah, Isaiah. But then, as only Christ can do, with the Galilean gaze, as if it were to stare a hole through their soul, when he would look at the disciples and say, but whom do you say I am? Peter would say, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. I want to go on record this morning saying I agree 1,000% with Peter. I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the anointed one, the son of the living God. I believe it with all my heart. It would be John the Baptist who would say Jesus is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. John the apostle would call him the Word that became flesh and dwelt among us. Who is Jesus? Isaiah 700 years before he was born would peer out into the prophetic future and see glimmering, dancing in the stygian of black the night that man would find himself in, this little light. And Isaiah would say, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. He would say he'll be a man, but yet he is deity. And he will be the king that will rule and reign. And then he would call him by name. When he said his name shall be called Wonderful. I don't know about you this morning, but I have found Jesus to be wonderful. I'm reminded of the old song, Isn't He Wonderful? Wonderful, wonderful. Isn't Jesus my Lord wonderful? Eyes have seen, ears have heard. It's recorded in God's Word. Isn't Jesus my Lord wonderful? Isaiah said his name shall be called Wonderful. His name shall be called Counselor because he is one that would be an advocate who would advocate for us. 
He would advise. He would assure. And Jesus Christ is the great attorney. He's the great counselor of all the ages. His name shall be called counselor. Isaiah said his name shall be called the mighty God, the strong and mighty conquering God. And Paul would come along and say, we are joint heirs with Christ. Therefore, we are more than conquerors through this mighty God. But today I want to deal with this name. Who is Jesus? Isaiah said, his name shall be called the everlasting father. The everlasting Father. Listen, the pre-existent paternal one. The pre-existent paternal one. What do you mean? I mean when he said he's the everlasting Father, that means he does not have a beginning. Jesus did not begin in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago. No, he was and is from everlasting to everlasting. He does not have a beginning. He does not have an end. He is the eternal one. Immutable. Eternal. And he said he would be the eternal father. What do you mean the paternal one? Paul would say it this way that Jesus was the creator of all things. Listen to what it says in Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. For by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. In other words, Jesus Christ is the Father of all things, the everlasting, preexistent, eternal creator of all things. And they were created by him and for him, the everlasting Father. Now you say, preacher, that all sounds great. But what does that mean to me right now, today? I want to give you three things. Three things very quickly. Number one, when he said he's the everlasting father, it means that there will be for us an everlasting provision. Let me say it. An everlasting power, rather. An everlasting power. Jesus Christ is the one of power. And even when he walked this earth, Jesus was one of power. When he spoke, his word was one of power. When he touched, he touched with a hand that was strong and mighty with power. When he spilled his blood, dying upon the cross, and opened this fountain in the house of David, his blood was one of power. When he rose again from the dead, he rose in strength and in power. And even now he sits on the immutable throne in heaven and rules and reigns in power. I'm talking about an everlasting strength and everlasting power. He is the God of power. I like power, don't you? I love power. I, if I have a car, I want it to be powerful. Most of the cars I've owned have been a V8. Why? Because when I hit the accelerator, I want to go. I don't want one of those little things that sounds like they're winding up band, you know, rubber bands to get you up a hill. I want something that goes. Power. I like electrical power till the bill comes. 
You know, the kids like to leave all the lights on. Mandy likes to leave all the lights on. They just do that because there's something about my wife and kids. They just love to waste money. Just throw it away. Just go ahead and put it in that toilet and flush. I stopped by Jerry Fry's house last night, and the whole outside was lit up. I mean, every light he had was on. Every light inside the house was on. I said, you like to waste money? He said, no, but I don't like to sit in the dark like you. I like electrical power until the bill comes. Man has harnessed the most powerful force he's been able to harness, nuclear power. We can create an explosion, destroy the world. We can harness nuclear power and provide electricity for a whole state. Nuclear power. Man has that ability. You listen to me. Man has the ability at the push of a button to destroy the entire world as we know it. That is power. But there's not enough power in that explosion to save one sinner's soul from hell. But you can take one little red drop of blood that Jesus shed 2,000 years ago on the cross, and that's enough power to reach all the way in hell and lift a man or a woman out and wash them and cleanse them and make them new and give them hope beyond this life. He is the God of power. The kind of power that when I need help, he can give me help. Isaiah would say it this way in Psalm 40. He gives power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increases strength. Even the young shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall, but they that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. I don't know how you feel this morning, but sometimes I get tired. We're living in a day where I've never seen like you see today, where people get so weary emotionally. People are weary spiritually. People are tired physically. We run, 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 and accomplish very little. It just seems like we've played the trick of the enemy, and we've become so busy that we can hardly see where we started or where we're going to end the day. I mean, it's just go, 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 go until we are worn out out emotionally, spiritually, and physically. But God said, I don't care what the situation of life is. If you need strength, your eternal, everlasting Father can give you strength. If you feel weak, He can give you strength in your body. He can give you strength in your mind. He can give you strength in your soul. He can give you strength in your heart. But he said, I'll go one step farther. Listen what he said he'll do. He said, you can mount up with wings like an eagle. You can run and not be weary. You can walk and not faint. What do you mean, preacher? He's saying, I know that there's going to be different times. There'll be times that you catch the draft, and high in the heavens you will soar above everything, above all the problems, above the pain, above the heartache. Things are good. Everything's going great. He said, there'll be other times that you're down to earth. You're feeling some of the pain of it, but you're full of strength, and you're running even against the wind, and you got all all the might and strength to run. He said, but there's going to come those days. And I feel like preaching all of a sudden. There's going to come those days when you're down to a walk or maybe even a crawl. And you think, I don't know if I can put one more foot in front of another. I don't know if I can wake up and face another day. But he said, you listen to me. Your everlasting Father promised, even when you're down to a crawl, you will not faint. He said, I'll come alongside you 
and say, I'm going to get you through another night. I'm going to get you through another day. I'm going to get you through another valley. I'm going to get you through the heartache and the pain. Woo! I say glory. He said, you will not faint. You almost forgot how to have church these days. You watch the rest of humanity. They face those times and they crumble and fall apart and spend their life savings talking to psychologists and counselors. But when the people of God go through those crippling times, God says, you will not waste. You will not faint but my strength and my power my strength and my power will bring you through It's only 11.45, i got plenty of time. Everlasting power. What does that mean for us today, preacher? It means what, what I tried to say a minute ago, everlasting provision. A father is one that provides for his family. And when Isaiah said he'll be an everlasting father, he's an everlasting provider. David said, I've been young and I've been old, but I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. Paul said, my God shall supply all our need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Jesus looked at the disciples and some of the others gathered around that day and he said, take no thought for your life. What will you eat? What will you wear? He said, don't worry about those things. The rest of the world, Gentiles worry about that. He said, but I want you to look at that sparrow. Your heavenly father takes care of that bird. I want you to look at that flower, that little lily. Your heavenly father takes care of that, that little flower in the field. How much more are you than these? He said, don't worry about it. I'm going to provide what you need. He said, you need food on your table. I'm going to put food on your table. You need a roof over your head. I'm going to put a roof over your head. You need clothing on your back. I'm going to put clothing on your back and shoes on your feet. We don't know what I'm preaching about anymore because we've become way too spoiled. But we need to be reminded this morning that if we woke up in a warm house, it's because our Heavenly Father has provided a warm house to live in. If we woke up in a bed, it's because our Heavenly Father has provided a bed for us to rest in. If we woke up this morning and did not think about what am I going to eat, but there is food in the cupboard and in the refrigerator, or we went down to McDonald's, and got our little sausage biscuit. It's because God has provided the means and the wherewithal. Have a roof up above me. Have a good place to sleep. Food on my table and shoes on my feet. You gave me your love, Lord, and a fine family. Thank you, Lord, for your blessings on me. We're living in a day where we take that way too much for granted. You hear me? I said we take it for granted. You say I'm a self-made man. All you are, are you? Well, let me ask you a question. Where did you get the air to breathe and the lungs and the capacity and the know-how to breathe it? Where did you learn how to use your muscles? Where did you get the know-how how and how did you get that job to work? It is God that put air in your lungs. It's God that put vitality and strength in your body. It is God that gave you that job. It's God that gave you the, the mental capacity and the ability in your body to work that job. It's God that provided that check. It's God that's done it all. He is our everlasting Father who provides for his children. Don't you kid yourself, it could all go away tomorrow. Are 
you still in this building? I don't know why in the world you're acting tired. I've already preached this once. It's my second round. If I get someone to help me, I'd preach it a third time. Provide. You know what? One of my favorite verses of this is when Jesus was, was giving assurance of answered prayer. He said, ask, and it shall be given. Seek, and you'll find. Knock, and the door will be open. And then he made this statement. He said, if you, being evil, just look at the man beside you. Look at him. Look at the man beside you and say, you're evil. I didn't figure there was one woman in this place having trouble doing that. <laughs> by nature, everybody look at me, by nature and by choice, we are evil. There's nothing about God that was evil, but we, on the other hand, everything about us, we're all born bent, messed up, evil by nature. He said, if you, this is so good, if you, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father, how much more will your heavenly Father give good gifts to his children? I remember when I was growing up, we didn't have much. Grew up very poor. My daddy had a massive heart attack in his late 50s. Strokes before that. I was three years old when he had his first massive heart attack. I remember that night like it was yesterday. It left an indelible impression. I didn't understand at, that, at three years old all that was going on, but I knew what it felt like, and this did not feel good what was going on in my house that night about three in the morning. I still remember that feeling of my dad having that massive heart attack. From there, it just got worse. He had to retire early. That made him worse financially. Every year, from the time I was nine years old growing up, I went to church camp. And there wasn't anything, much of anything else I was able to do. We had no money. But the church would pay our way to church camp. And every year, I went to the same church camp as Todd. We grew up going to church camp. The time we was nine years old, same church camp. We had a lot of fun there, you know. It was, you know, Todd was the, the, the good one. <laughs> and I was the ornery one. I remember one year we were neck and neck for camp of the year. You had to be exemplary for camp of the year. I mean, there was Todd outside the tabernacle helping old ladies out of their car, and I'm like, you make me sick. <laughs> make me sick. He didn't do it until one of the counselors were walking around. Oh, excuse me, honey, can I help you into the tabernacle? <laughs> Took his coat off and laid it across the mud puddle. It was, it was ridiculous. Still makes me sick to this day. <laughs> I want to tell you something. We were neck and neck for camp of the year. We were neck and neck, and I would have won. I would have got it had they not caught me kissing that girl behind the tabernacle. <laughs> I would have got it! I think, I, I really believe that Todd and his... Buddies were following me around to catch me. <laughs> and one of them went and told someone and they caught me. I knew when they walked around behind the tabernacle and I was kissing her, and they because that's a no-no at church camp. I knew at that point, well, I lost. <laughs> and Todd got camper of the year and I got runner up. And don't you kid yourself. He kissed the girl. He just didn't get caught. <laughs> we grew up going to the same church camp. And every year, I remember 9, 10, 11, on and up. Every year, I'd, Daddy would give me $5 to take to church camp. Spend the money, a dollar a day, five days. Go to the snack bar or, or the bookstore to buy a little something. I was about 11 years old, 10, 11 years old, and that year he had no money. We had nothing. And Dad said, son, I don't have money to give you. Church paid our way to camp. They said, I don't have $5. I was so brokenhearted. 
I didn't want to be the only little boy at camp that didn't have any money to spend at the snack bar. While all my other friends were going over getting something, I, I, I wanted to be able to go get something. But Dad just didn't have it. He said, well, maybe you can find some way to make $5. And there was a farmer. He had a number of farms. He farmed between Kentucky and Ohio and West Virginia. And he would travel in, in a circuit on farms. And he had a big piece of property near where we lived. And he was working that field. And I remember climbing that fence. And I went up to that farmer. And I said, you got any work I could do? I just want to make $5 to take to church camp with me. He said, I lost a grease gun out here in this field. If you find that grease gun, I'll give you $5. Children, I searched all day until lunch. And I went home. Dad said, did you find it? I said, not yet. He said, keep it going, boy. Keep working and all afternoon I uncovered every blade of grass and never did find that grease gun and I went to the fellow and I said I couldn't find it he said well I'm sorry he didn't give me the five dollars either and I don't blame him that was the agreement you find the grease gun I give you five dollars I didn't find it I remember going home <laughs> laying in bed crying The next day, I was going to camp. I was sitting in the back seat. My sister was going to take us to the church. And my dad walked out. He said, roll the window down, boy. I rolled the window down. He leaned in. He said, give me your hand, son. And I stretched my little hand out. He said, son, I'm so sorry. But in a little jar up above the stove in the cabinet, you know, we saved some change up there. He said, this is all I've got. This is all the money I've got in this world right now. He said, give me your hand. He poured, I think it was about 78 cents in my little hand. He closed my hand. He said, I wish it was more. I wish it was more. It wasn't enough. But looking back now, Elder Shannon, that 78 cents, I wouldn't trade that memory for a million dollars. Because my evil father loved me enough to pour in my little hand the last penny he had that month so that I could take it to church camp. If my evil daddy loved me enough to do that, how much more will my heavenly father, who spins world off the tips of his fingers and flings stars against the black velvet and carves out rivers and scoops up oceans and has the cattle on a thousand hills and the old timers where I grew up over in the hills would say and owns all the taters in the hills if he does all of that how much more will he provide for his children how much more well praise God He's been good to me. I want to tell you, he has been good to me. If you could see where he brought me from to where I am today, he has been good to me. We used to sing a song growing up in church. Give me C sharp. I did that on purpose. We used to sing a song growing up in church. When something like this, oh, Lord, you've been so good to me. Oh. You've been so good to me. You have done what this world could not do. Now, we did it something like this, though. You're going to have to help me. I don't have a drum, so you're going to have to help me. Can you give me a hand clap? Just don't get with me. Wait a minute. Oh, dear God, have mercy. You're almost there. Oh, Lord. You've been so good to me. Oh, Lord, you've been so good to me. You have done what this world could not do. They had, now them old songs, they had like 2,500 verses. I mean, it went on forever. They'd sing something like this. You satisfied my longings, Lord, supplied my every need. You sanctified me, holy Lord, you've been my friend indeed. You have done what this world could not do. And then there's another verse that went like this. You sat, wait a minute, wait a minute, no, wait. You fed me when I was hungry, Lord, warmed me when I was cold. 
You gave me drink when thirsty, Lord, you led me to the fold. You have done what this world could not do. Let me think here. Let me give you the, the preacher's favorite verse. Keep going. I want to give you the preacher's favorite verse. You help me tithe my money, Lord. You help me tithe my money, Lord. You help me sing and shout. Well, you open the windows of heaven, Lord, and pour the blessings out. You have done what this world could not do. I like this one. This is the last one. We're listening for the trumpet sound to hear the angels sing. We are looking for a great white cloud to see our coming king. You have done what this world could not do. How many can testify God's been good to you? Oh, Lord. You've been so good to me. Hallelujah. Oh, Lord, you've been so good to me. You have done what this world could not do. The everlasting Father gives us an everlasting provision. He provides our needs in this life and in the one to come. Let me give you the last point. When Isaiah said he's the everlasting Father, He's saying he will give us an everlasting presence. One day God went to Joshua and he said, Moses is dead. Now, I know, Joshua, you'd just prefer that he stick around, but Moses is dead. But he said, listen to me, Joshua. As I was with Moses, so shall I be with thee. And then he said, let me just nail this thing down for you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. You'll always have my presence. He said to Isaiah, fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, I am your God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. And in a couple chapters over, he said, Isaiah, remember, when you walk through the water, I'll be with you. And through the rivers, they'll not overflow you. You'll walk in the fire, and I will be there. He'll never leave us. David said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you, for thou art with me. There's nothing, listen. There's nothing better in this life than having the presence of God. And there's nothing worse than him being absent. God says, I'll be with you. When I was putting this sermon together, I told the story about dad, and I, I couldn't help, you know, when he says everlasting father, you just think about your father. I thought about my dad. I was thinking about really one of my fondest memories of dad. I was five years old, six years old. We'd always go to church. And mom always wanted to get there early, and she always left late. And dad would always say it this way, well, we've got to get going. The girls want a jaw. You know what jaw is? Run your jaws. Talk. Dad would say they want a jaw. Dad wasn't much of one for jawing. You know, believe, me, believe it or not, I'm more like dad in that than you know. You know, dad and mom, they just loved to be around people. John, dad wasn't that way. In fact, if, if there were people who were visiting at our house, my dad, he'd done this more than once. He'd say, well, you all stay as long as you like. I'm going to bed. <laughs> he'd just go to bed. He said, you can stay all night and make yourself at home, but I've jawed enough. I don't want to hear any more. I'm going to bed. That's dad. So he wasn't much of one for John. So we'd get to church. Then after church, he'd say, come on, son. Mom and the girls are going to jaw. Let's go to the car. We'd go out to the car. I remember those cold winter mornings or winter evenings. It would be so, so cold. And those, you remember, some of you older people will remember the older cars. You know, there used to be a day you didn't start the car and it got warm within two minutes. 
No. Them old cars, it was still cold 20 minutes later. You'd press the gas and try to get that water hot pushing through it. You know, I mean, it was cold in those cars. We had an old Dodge Dart push button. And Dad said, come on, let's go warm the car up for, for Mom and the girls. Man, that car was so cold. And I'd sit there shivering. And I remember my daddy would say, come here, son. Had an old brown coat. He'd unzip that coat and open it up. And he'd say, crawl in. And I'd crawl in and wrap my arms as far as around as they'd go. Those strong arms of dad. He'd take that coat and wrap them around me and just envelop me. I'd lay my head on his shoulder and just fall asleep. In my lifetime, I have never found any place more warm or safe in my mind and memory than those Sunday nights wrapped up in my daddy's arms. Some time ago, my brother Bob told me something I didn't know. He said, you know, Troy said, Dad was a tough man. Went through the Depression back in the 30s and four years of war and World War II. He said he was meaner than a snake, wasn't he? I said, yeah. He said, I never saw Dad cry one time except for once. My whole life. He said, my whole life I never saw Dad cry except one time. Two days before he died. I said, really? He said, yeah. He said, I just got off work and there wasn't anyone at the hospital. And I thought this would give me a chance to have some time with Dad, just me and Dad. He said, when I walked in the hospital room, Dad was in the bed, and he was crying. He said, it struck me because I'd never seen Dad cry. He said, Dad, what is it? And Dad just grinned his teeth. Nothing. Nothing. Dad, why are you crying? Nothing. Mm -mm. Nothing, Bob. Dad, what's wrong? Nothing, Bob. Just leave me alone. And Bob said, look at me, Dad. He said, is it Troy? And Dad said, yeah. He said, Bob, he's 13. And all I wanted to do was make it until he was a man grown and graduated from high school. But I'm not going to make it, Bob. I wanted to get him through school. I'm going to make it. Bob said, don't worry, Dad. I'll get him through school. There was nothing in my father wanted to leave me before I was grown. But time and physical condition and the will of God said otherwise. I remember... be 36 years now this December 31st I'll never forget it as long as I live walking through my brother's house knowing that dad wasn't going to make it it's a cold December night the day before it had snowed pretty heavily I was standing in the kitchen looking out the window the earth was covered with a canopy of snow and I looked out into the heavens, and that night it was as clear as a bell. Those stars looked like they were magnified against the black velvet. You could reach out and touch them. The moon was so full and brilliant, and it just looked like the light of the moon was dancing on that snow. And inside, I was dying. And I looked out there toward the heavens and I said, God, I don't, please don't take daddy. Please don't take him. I don't want to live without my daddy. Please don't take daddy. I don't know what I'll do without daddy. Now listen, you may think I'm crazy. But as sure as my name is what it is, Jesus walked in that kitchen. Oh, it wasn't physical, but it almost felt as though. Because in the Holy Spirit, he literally stood right beside me and he pulled me close. And Jesus whispered in my ear and he said, your dad's gone, but I'm not. I will be your father and I'll never leave you. Over the last 36 years, church, there have been 10,000 times. 
that I would have given anything to go to Washington and crawl in that brown jacket, have the strong arms of my dad wrap around me and pull me close and say, it's going to be all right, son. There's been 10,000 times I'd love to sit down and talk to him, but I can't, and he can't. But in the wee hours of the morning when nobody else understood and there was nobody around me, Jesus has been my father where he would wrap himself around me and pull me close and say, it's going to be all right, son. I'm with you. You're going to make it. I'm with you. It's okay. I'm with you. He has been and shall always be an everlasting father. His presence. His presence. Isaiah said it well. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father. Isn't it wonderful to know that we have a daddy like that? I know a long time ago, it's been Katie was just little. She may have been or oh, one of Bella's age, one of the little girls now. I can't remember, but I was in my office and I was changing clothes and Becky and Katie came to the door and they knocked on the door and I just ignored it. And then I heard them talking. And they yelled, hey! And I ignored it because I was changing my clothes. And Becky said something like, Maybe if you say, Pastor Troy, you're needed, he'll open the door. You know what Katie said? She said, nah, I think it would be better. I think it would be better if I just say, Daddy. That got me. <laughs> I said, I'll be right there. And when we come to our Heavenly Father, we don't have to assign all the titles. We can just say, Daddy. And he says, I'm there. <laughs> I'm there. Isaiah said, he's the everlasting Father. Stand with me, please. I've kept you long enough. He is here, hallelujah, he is here, amen, he is here, holy, holy, I will bless his name This morning and you would say I'm unsaved I'm away from God or I'm backslidden or I have a need or I need God to give me strength or I need some provision or I just need his presence to envelop me and let him let me know that he's with me I don't know what your need is today but I do know your father can meet it and I'm gonna ask you to do something bold and brave if you need to pray I'm gonna ask you to step out of your seat just like they did in the early service. And come and kneel right here. And your everlasting Father is going to meet you. And he's going to touch you, heal you, help you, whatever you need. He's here. And I ask you to come and kneel before him and let him do something in your life. We're going to sing it again. Why don't you step out? He is here. Hallelujah. He
Thank you, Jesus, for what you're doing. Thank you, Lord, for each person. You know the need of their life. You're our Heavenly Father. And we pray, God, that you'll meet every one of them, that you'll come in your strength and in your power, in your glory and in your might. Isaiah said he's the everlasting Father. And I pray that you'll meet your children at the point of their need. Touch them, God, spiritually, physically, emotionally, whatever it is they need today. I pray, Lord, that you'll do a supernatural work by your strength and by your power. We receive it now. Show yourself mighty. May they be a trophy of your grace, of what you can do in somebody's life. I thank you for what you're doing, Jesus. And I pray, Lord, that you'll be with each one. I ask God that as we leave this place today that your spirit and presence would go with every person. May your grace be upon us this week. And help us, God, to continue to look to you and trust you in and for all things. We praise you again for what you've done in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen to me. Be reverent to the Holy Spirit. There are those who are still praying at the altar. Keep your voices low until you exit the room. God bless you. You're dismissed. He is here. He is here.